Welcome to the Cult of Domesticity podcast, where two best friends tell each other stories about history, true crime, and other shenanigans. I'm Courtney. I'm Ashley. And today we have a special guest named... Rachel! Yay! Yay! We brought Rachel back, guys, and this time I don't get to horrify her. Rachel gets to horrify horrify us. Yes! We're very excited. Okay. (laughs) Mainly because I don't think Rachel has ever horrified me with anything. No, not really. And we lived together, so... We did. We had one magical year together. It was magical. So magical. Look at Ashley. Ashley, well, Ashley had to live with you too, so. Yeah, I did. Not for a year. Do I just keep bringing people who've, like, lived with me or, like, I went to school with last year? We've just had a high rate of exposure to Courtney, that's all. (laughs) (laughs) Prepared for anything. (laughs) You're welcome. All right, are you guys ready? Yes. Do we need to buckle up? Is it that uh, that extreme or what? Yeah, do we need to brace? Do our best life alert impression. What are we doing? Uh, you know, I don't know. Let's see. I don't think it's too intense where you're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> there is one dead baby. I'll warn you now. Courtney's favorite. Yep. <laughs> I gave Rachel many dead babies. <laughs> I got one. Just one. All right. So today I'm going to tell you guys about the first emperor of China that was a girl. Wow. Her name, <laughs> her name was Wu Zetian, and she, if you've ever played the game uh, Civilization V, is one of the leaders you could choose. So that's how I first learned about her, was through the game. I have not. You should play it. It's a fun game. You keep telling me this, but we never play, and it makes me sad. You have to download on your computer, and then we can all play together. <laughs> Anyways, so not a whole lot is known about her upbringing. There's a couple different theories. Mainly... She was the daughter of a, like, kind of a a guy who was pretty high in the government. And he helped the first emperor of the Tang dynasty overthrow the ruler of the Sui dynasty, which was the dynasty before this. And she was known for her beauty, and she was known for being... Trained in reading, writing, art, music, things that females were not normally uh, taught. Did she bring honor to us all? (laughs) No, no, she didn't. She didn't. She brought honor to her family, though, because she was chosen as, wait for it, a concubine. Dishonor on her and her cow. She she probably killed her cow, let's be honest. (laughs) Okay, wait, Rachel... Can you explain the concubine system with, like, the emperor? Yeah, so in China, it's kind of like the original Bachelor. So (laughs) all the most beautiful people from China were chosen for the emperor, and they were. It's more commonly known, you know. A lot of people think concubine sex. So yes, that is true. But um, they had their own hierarchy and. They had different levels, so there was, like, the first concubine, and then there was the concubine at the bottom, whose job was pretty much to be a maid. Um, And they were just really beautiful women who were there to keep the emperor company and help with the daily uh, tasks around the palace. So they weren't just there, you know, to have children. They were there for daily palace uh, needs and then some of them would eventually make their ranks up which is what will happen with Wu Zetian to where they become the emperor's favorite or they fight and squabble with each other to try and get higher up. So Wu Zetian just kind of give you a quick background is from the Tang dynasty and the Tang dynasty has been described as one of the greatest imperial dynasties in ancient China it had a lot of growth in China's economy. It's where a lot of inventions excuse me, came from, such as gunpowder, air conditioning, gas stoves, printing advancements in medicine, science, technology, architecture, and literature. It was also a big period for poetry. With the advancement of the printing press, a lot more people were able to read, and so poetry was a huge thing you're familiar i believe it's the might be the meiji dynasty in japan where the tale of genji comes from 
where it was all about having, you know, social gatherings and exchanging poetry with each other and what you read and what was really awesome about what you read. It says over 50,000 poems, plays, short stories, and other literary works were produced during the Tang Dynasty. That's a lot. That is a lot, yeah. So a lot of free time on some people's hands. Uh, not a whole not a whole lot to do in ancient China um, but it was a really prosperous time for China and the population grew and there was a lot of development with agriculture so there weren't a lot of people some dynasties are plagued with people who have been starving or natural disasters so this is a time period when it was the opposite they were having a lot of growth so Wu Zetian came in as a concubine for the Emperor Taizong. And Taizong, so there are a couple different theories. She started out as a low concubine and she was in charge of things such as the laundry. So there's a couple stories. <laughs> yep, I know, right? Pretty <laughs> exciting. It's like saying she started in an ancient mail room. Yeah, yeah, she Sorry. started in the mail room and worked <laughs> her way up. You could say she slept her way to the top. <gasps> I could, but she killed everyone, so I don't know. <laughs> Not a lot of sleep there. Some people believe she was able to get close to the emperor because she was in charge of the laundry, so she got to change his sheets. And so she got access oh. to the bedroom. I'm just, I'm sorry. You, could you just imagine, like, you have to change his sheets after he's been with someone else? Well, usually, I think, yeah. I don't actually space us at all. Well, yeah. So, just, not, not very appealing. Another story was that while she was doing laundry, the emperor was around, and oh, gasp, she spoke freely about Chinese politics to the emperor, and he was impressed. <gasps> Dare you? He was what? impressed. I know, right? Already, strike one. Strike one. She opened her a woman who can speak <laughs> her mind. I'm sorry. She oh. was. She was indeed a girl worth fighting for. It's giving me the vapors. Yeah. The vapors. I know. So she was speaking about Chinese politics and history with the emperor, and he was so impressed that he made her his secretary. Another story is that the emperor had this horse, and he could not what tame... What is it with our podcast and horses? Horses are cool, okay? You say that like it's Rachel's fault, when really it's absolutely not her fault. <laughs> it's not her fault. It's just the universe... Cursing us with so horse stories that have nothing to do with the main main person we're talking about. Uh, this horse could have everything. You don't know. This horse could be like the horse. I was just gonna say this could be the horse, capital T, capital H. No, that's Caligula's, I believe. <laughs> Valid. <laughs> it could be. It could be. I'm trying to find the quote here, but so there was this horse that the emperor could not tame. So. Wu Zetian went over and said, hey, I got this. She told the emperor and the people around him that what she would do first was that she would beat the horse. And then if the horse didn't submit, she would slash its neck. And that is how she would subdue the horse. And the emperor was blown away. And he let her continue I'm sorry. on. Her, her method was, I'm going to beat it. And if it's not tamed by that point, I'm just gonna kill it. Right, because if it's not tamed by that point, it wasn't gonna obey, and it wasn't worth her time. So. <laughs> I'm sensing this is gonna be a pattern. <laughs> it is gonna be a pattern. She does not have a lot of time for a lot of things. Red flag! Red flag! Red flag! Red flag! So, Taizong passes away, and in traditional practice, when the emperor passes away, all his concubines are forced to shave their heads, and they go to a Buddhist monastery and become Buddhist nuns. So she follows that, but while she was what? Your face is saying something. Um, why do I feel like she's gonna say fuck no to being a Buddhist nun? She seems to not have patience for a lot of things, and I feel like most of being a Buddhist is patient. Yeah, surprisingly, she, I mean, she really liked Buddhism, but in this situation, she went to the monastery like she was supposed to, but the entire time, and that's why it gets a little weird, so the entire time that she was a concubine of the Emperor Taizong, she was also possibly in an affair with her, with his son, 
who also had a I know also had a wife and his own first concubine. So what? when Haizong dies, uh, okay, wait, wait, how much time did these guys spend? running an empire or country <laughs> it literally just seems like they're like well gonna go visit my wife gonna go visit my first concubine gonna go visit my side piece is that not what henry the eighth did every day of his life yeah though? but we all know he did not run his country yeah that's fair <laughs> all right fair point <laughs> no no i understand i mean some of them had couple concubines like one emperor i think only had like three and then some could have up to 60 so only quote unquote only yeah so <laughs> only had pers- three. personal preference you know <laughs> 60 is just a lot and also they had all these other officials and ministry people who probably basically did the majority of the work for them so taizong's son prince li Zhu, becomes the emperor and he decides wait i want wu Tian back so he has her brought back to the palace I know, right? No, I'm just thinking of what I always... It's what I say about, like, Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> oh, no. Not this girl again. must have, like... She's gonna have, like, a magical vagina, because, like... Except for... She seems to be, like, a little bit smarter about it. Those girls were just like... I'm like, I don't understand why all these guys are like, I love you. And I'm just like, why? She just kind of stands there and it's like... Ugh. Well, it was her wit and her sensibility and all her knowledge that she wasn't supposed to have that wowed them. And she was really beautiful, you know, because only the emperor gets the most beautiful people in China. So that's at least, that's at least fair, you know. I'm sure she might have also had a magical vagina. I don't know. Who knows? We'll find the out. The emperor and his son probably know. <sighs> yeah. Throw that out there. They found out. <laughs> 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 the eyebrow raise really made that. <laughs> I know, right? So sh- <laughs> Whoa. You all right over there? Yep, I'm just knitting away. Okay. <laughs> I broke Ashley. I'm all right. Carry on without me. How many times do you almost die in this? Po- I, you'd podcast? think I would know better by now, but clearly I don't. So Lija becomes Emperor Gao Tong, and he brings Wu Tian Wu Zetian back as his first concubine, even though he had a wife, and other concubines. And when you're the first... She just, she's, she's now top bitch. H-B-I-C. You got it. She's on the top of the... Top of the... Uh, top of the emperor's pole. <laughs> Let's not turn this into that. <laughs> True, but inappropriate. True, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, can, can, can I just say, I when you said top of his pole, I just pictured kind of like Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> oh my god. Courtney. True, but inappropriate. That should have been the title of our podcast. <laughs> True, but inappropriate. It's not too late. We're only 33 episodes in now. We can change it. It's fine. Rebranding. What up? I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel just gets dragged into this all the time. She doesn't want to be. That's basically our friendship. I was going to say, that's kind of the summary of how things go with the three of us. Anyways, getting back to the lovely love triangle thing. So... She becomes the first concubine, so she is the head concubine. And you can do further research, but there is a lot of ins and outs of what your position is in terms of first concubine, second concubine, and what powers you have, and how much food you get, how many people you get to help you, like ladies in waiting, who will basically do everything for you. So it's pretty good to be on top. But, um, so, anyways... (laughs) So Wu Zetian realizes that she wants power. She wants to be in charge. She loves power. Ha ha ha. Right. So. <laughs> no, that was straight up Yzma from the Emperor's New Groove right there. <laughs> she's got a l- I think she's got a little bit of Yzma in her. She's just dealing with idiots. Pull the lever. Which wrong lever? Wrong lever. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, she wants power. She wants to be more than just first concubine. She wants to be his wife. But, as you might remember, he already has a wife. And so her name is Lady Wong. And Just keep going. Courtney, no, we're going to sit here and make this face at you until you stop laughing. Courtney, Chinese is beautiful language. Don't insult me. I'm not insulting it. I'm just enjoying it. 
Yep. And then the lady, his uh, other, like, concubine or lady was known as Lady Xiao or the pure concubine, which honestly, I don't know how a concubine can be pure, but... Maybe she was really bad at her job. No, she could be, like, very moral and very, like, pure of soul. Maybe she liked a lot of white, which I don't understand because it, it, it gets stained so easily. That, That's that why is true. the yeah. perfect metaphor. <laughs> Anyways, so... Anyway. Li Zhe, or Emperor Gao Zhong, says that uh, Lady Wang has a brother, and his son can be the next emperor. And Wu Zetian's like, eh, not okay. Because she ends up having a couple sons of her own. And as you may know, having a son in ancient China was a pretty big deal. And it could elevate your status from like the bottom to the top if you were a concubine and you had a son. Because that son could oh, then become yeah. the emperor, possibly, depending on how things played out. And that also gave you and your family a lot of power. So it was a pretty big deal. So Wu Zetian decides that she is going to get rid of Lady Wang and Lady Xiao. Now, this is probably the most infamous story with her, and there is some debate on what actually happened. I'm going to go with murder. Yeah. <laughs> Ashley's face. My brain, my brain brought up Dwight from The Office, where he says R is the most aggressive letter. That's why it's called murder, not muck duck. I don't remember that line. Maybe I'll have to go back and look. By my face, I was like, why is that where my brain goes? But also, Cordy's dramatic Angela Lansbury style. Murder. Murder. That was pretty good, too. This was kind of like a giant soap opera at the time, but you know what royal history isn't? They're not Chinese dynasties, they're dynasty. I want them to make like a soap opera or like a... Uh, you know, real housewives of New Jersey, but, like, the real concubines of ancient China or something. I would watch that. <laughs> I would, too. <laughs> it can get a bit intense. So, Wu Zetian had a daughter, and the daughter died within a few days of being born. And Ooh, ooh, can I guess? Smothered. Unknown, <laughs> but most likely. So, what you can't happens? Prove it. They can't prove, can't it. prove anything. That's why you smother someone with a pillow. Come on! It's called SIDS. Don't be insensitive, Courtney. So, Wu Zetian finds out her daughter is dead. And she goes to the emperor and she says, Lady Wong killed my daughter. And the emperor has no choice because Lady Wong was the last one seen with the baby. She was holding the baby. And she has no alibi other than that. That is unfortunate yeah that poor unfortunate soul. a lot of historians believe that Wu Zetian killed her own daughter to advance in the ranks and that she framed Lady Wang and Lady Xiao to get rid of them so that she could become Emperor Gao Zhong's wife and therefore the emperors of China so Lady Wang is banned from the palace and she is sent away and Lady Xiao is also sent away Later on, it said that Wu Zetian had them both killed. Now, again, there is debate on how they were killed. So the story goes, and I can get a little, a little gross. So, um, welcome to this podcast. I like Ashley's just like let me <laughs> settle me in more. to hear about this. Murder. <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. So what happened was Wu Zetian had their arms and legs cut off and they were thrown in a vat of wine. And then she said as she walked away that they could now get drunk in their bones. Something around those lines. Solid movie villain line. Yeah. Yeah. And then she walked away and was like, ha 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 ha. <laughs> it is my. <laughs> So historians don't know if that story is actually true because there was an empress before Wu Zetian that did something just like that, but believe it or not, a lot more intense. And people think that she was just associated with that because of what she will eventually do later on and China's general reaction to her, which was, spoiler alert, not very good. So it, she did a Marie Antoinette Let's Eat Cake. Let them eat cake, which is actually she never actually not, said that, but okay. 
she never actually said that it was it had been used in previous famines and all of that but it just became associated with her because they were known for their extravagance and, and all of that shenanigans Robespierre decided that he was going to smear Marie Antoinette but anyway it's a different story for another day Lady Wong since she was banned from the palace her the person from her family who was going to become the emperor lost that right so now Wu Zetian's sons could gain power two birds one stone or we're like one five baby. birds one yeah. stone she was a fish it she was a fish it pretty solid stone to task ratio right there does she have like is it like one of the stones just attach it to uh a string and she's just swinging it around like i'm hitting everyone <laughs> like the uh, French king's chain cannonballs in the Borgias. Or the hot irons that Mike told us about. Yes, or that hot shot. So she is now the empress because the emperor decides, hey, my wife is gone. I can now have my first concubine as my wife. Woo! That was his plan all along. I like the emperor's just like, yeah. Oh, He's like, oh, my, my, look, my... you found a way to do that thing that I was going to get around to eventually. Good job. Thanks. Sorry about your kid, but good job. Yeah. Now you... Me and your magical vagina can be alone. <laughs> We're just not gonna touch that. Literally or figuratively. Da na 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 Oh my gosh, Courtney, what? Why are you bringing dishonor on MC Hammer and his cow? What are you doing? I've been talking a lot about the sound of music, so I've just been thinking about musicals and such. I don't think... You can't touch this in a musical. Unless you found <laughs> that one episode of Family Guy is a musical. And then, maybe. No, but it just it's just me pulling from my reservoir of musical and or music knowledge. <laughs> it's deep. It is a vast chasm of reference. You all right over there? Yeah. You, you dead? I'm going to go back to this. <laughs> Your podcast. I'll let you do whatever you want. But Don't do that. We'll never get out of here, Rachel. <laughs> you got to take the lead here. <laughs> <laughs> Take control, Rachel! Empress Wu Zetian becomes Empress, and then suddenly an earthquake, and a mountain appears, and in Chinese- well, probably what? what caused the earthquake. The mountain just shows up out of nowhere. Do they not know about the mountain? No, no, they was know about just... the mountain. The mountain is a huge deal, which I will tell you if you just stop asking questions <laughs> and wait till I'm done. <laughs> I love you so much, Rachel. <laughs> so this mountain appears, and in Chinese culture, an earthquake was seen as a bad omen. And uh, in the podcast Relic, Maxwell talks about, and I'll shout out, the Mandate of Heaven, which is this idea that, in addition to the seal, that heaven, if there was like a natural disaster, such as a famine, a flood, earthquake, tsunami, all that Heaven was saying that the person ruling was not fit to be ruler. So anything that happened like that, people saw that as, oh, the emperor, this is not a good emperor to be on the throne of China. So that's how people reacted to this. But Wu Zetian decided, actually, no, it's a good sign. Because a mountain appeared, right? Well, a mountain appeared, and she knew that most people in China didn't really like her being there because... Confucianism was very uh, strong at the time, and the idea, one of the relationships is between um, a man and his wife, and the wife, ha you know, obeyed the emperor, or obeyed her husband, and for uh, an empress to be primarily in control was not, not good with Confucian believers and Confucian scholars, so they were not happy. So they were kind of behind uh, this mountain being a bad omen. So this mountain appears and Wu says says, no, it is a favor from heaven saying that she is right for ruler. Direct quote yeah. from the mountain right there. Direct quote. That's what the mountain said. It said to her in a dream. You're the one. The mountain just sang out. It was just like, we are, she is the rightful ruler. <laughs> the mountain is just down there going, you're the one that I want. Yes, so the mountain <laughs> appeared, and instead of the Greek muses from Hercules, <laughs> there were Chinese muses that were, you know, praising her, her name. I like it. Yep, I'm glad you like it. My life is just meant to serve you. Yay! Yay! 
So I realized I've got to forget something important. Dates. Welcome <laughs> to our life, dude. Every week. <laughs> so this is happening in around, you know, 600 to about 700 CE. That's Actually, our math person, do you know how long ago that was? A, a long really long time, time ago. Smarty pants. A long time ago. Yeah, so the Tang Dynasty was established in 618, and she came to the palace in 637, and then she became the empress at 655, and now we are caught up. Look so in CE, for people who don't know, is what they changed from AD, so instead of after death, it's now common era. Oh, thank you, I never knew that. Fun fact! Yay, fun facts with Courtney. That should be, like, a kid's TV show, but then it might get canceled. Yeah, um, not for children. <laughs> Courtney's fun facts that are not for kids. Yeah! With singing. Lots and lots of singing. Not good singing, either. You are worse. It's never stopped you. <laughs> so shortly after becoming Empress, Wu Zizian institutes the holy titles of Heavenly Empress and Heavenly Emperor for her and her husband. Not overcompensating for anything. No, no. no, this is all about her, Ashley. She probably, like, doesn't even care about him. <laughs> She's just using him. It's like a, dull, a gold digger, but, you know. Chinese and ancient? Yeah, <laughs> and probably getting a lot more than just funny. <laughs> so she institutes a 12-point program of reform, and... The main things in this reform were that she encouraged agricultural production, reduced taxes and labor services, decreased military operations, provided wide opportunities for criticism and reform of government, promoted long-serving officials, and increased official salaries. And in addition, she created what is now known as the uh, official examination. I had to think about that for a second. So normally, before this time, people within the inner circle of the emperor and military personnel were promoted and given titles based on who they knew and how their family was related in terms of title. But she decided that everyone had to take an exam and that it wasn't just going to be based on who you knew, but you know how well you were able to implement procedures and in terms of military, probably how well you were able to command a group of people and lead them in to battle and be successful so that um, so she she's the one who did the transferred it to a merit-based system yes thank you better description yes. meritocracy what meritocracy Ooh. we're just turning everything into songs we are today. the songs and sniffles podcast and if we're running short on one we gotta compensate with the other and no longer allergy season. God it's willing. Spring. So. so I'm gonna clap. I love clapping. The <laughs> so the following year, the eldest son of Gao Zong, Emperor Gao Zong, and Empress Wu, Li Hong, died suspiciously, suddenly. Courtney. Oh, can I? Uh, were they poisoned? Possibly, but they were murdered. Murder. Murder. Muck duck. So. A lot of people believe that Wu Zetian was the one behind the emperor, or not the emperor, the one behind killing her son. So she killed her daughter now. She killed her son. But wait, there's more. All right, Billy Mays. <laughs> oh my gosh, Billy Mays. All right, Pete. I know. In addition, she had her other son, Li Xian was charged with preparing a coup and treason. And he was banished to a remote area. And he had a wife who was very much like Wu Zetian in the fact that she was trying to gain power, and Wu Zetian did not like that. So she banished her as well. So she banished her son, and she banished his wife, and she killed her first son. You know, she's just getting making lots of friends. Left, right, kill someone there, kill someone Literally. there. Conspire to kill someone there, killing people everywhere. So in late 683, Emperor Galzong died, and he had a stroke. So a lot of times he was, yeah, stroke. I was right? say, is you it know? a stroke or is it a stroke? So 
he didn't, you know, die suddenly. He did die over the course, <laughs> slowly came to his death over the course of a few years, but he did suffer a stroke. And during this time, a lot of times he could not perform his emperor duties. So Wu Zetian would act on his behalf and would go to his chambers and read to him the, I guess, scholarly de degree decrees that the people sent for him. And sometimes she read what was on the page. Sometimes she read whatever she felt like. And <laughs> she made stuff up. Um, and she acted as kind of the behind the scenes default ruler since the emperor was not always in the position to rule. So basically she was the ancient version of Edith Wilson, but like without the solid motivation for the good of her own country. Yeah. Okay. She, she was all about herself. It's all about me. Excellent. And also at this time, she organized military campaigns against Korea and won and basically reduced Korea to a status of a vassal state and a lot of other areas around China that the Tong Dynasty was fighting with, she successfully either pushed them off or reduced them to a much smaller amount. So yay for her! Woo! Woo woo! Getting all the land! Getting all the land! Mm -hmm. Gonna mm -hmm. get all the land! Yeah! <laughs> so... Ashley's literally going to murder me, like, through the computer. The look she's giving me for this much singing. So, backing up a little bit, she killed off one of her sons, and then she put her second son, who became Zhong Zong. Zhong Zong. Wait, can I try that one? Yeah. Zhong Zong! Yeah, not to sound really insensitive, but it kind of sounds like if you're hitting a bell, you know, Zhong Zong. <laughs> Zhong Zong. Yeah, that's the most insensitive we've been tonight. Good, good work. Your definition of insensitive <laughs> is different than my definition. <laughs> so he refused to cooperate with her because she still wanted all the power. And his wife, who I was talking about earlier, Lady Wei, assumed too much power. So they psh, kicked out of the, uh, the uh, palace. They were not allowed to come back. And her other son became Emperor Wei Zong. And she kept him basically under house arrest. And he was confined to the inner palace. And... <laughs> I quote, Rei Zong was also a disappointment to her, and so she forced him to abdicate in 690 CE. Relatable. I just like all her children are disappointments, so she either kills them or makes them abdicate. Yeah, or she kicks them out. Your parents will never be that disappointed in you. No, I know. Want to bet? Never. <laughs> so now that she is kicked out, all of her daughters, or she killed her daughter, kicked out all her sons. She decides, you know what, I got this. So she declares herself Emperor Zuotian, ruler of China. And she creates her own dynasty called the Zhou Dynasty. So it was customary for rulers when a new dynasty came in or a group of people who were not part of the previous family to declare the end of the previous dynasty and the beginning of the new one. So she decided this is the end of the Tang Dynasty. She took the, the crown or whatever they wear, put it on her head and said, I am the emperor of China. I'm a girl, but I'm an emperor. And I'm going to create my own kingdom called the Zhou Dynasty. And her name, Wu Zutian, Wu is associated for, with the words for weapon, fitting, and military force. And she chose the name Zutian, which means ruler of the heavens. And she wanted to make it clear that there was a new person sitting on the throne of China. Best beware. And in case people didn't believe her, she, in 688, a white stone bearing eight Chinese characters was discovered in the Low River. The lettering was carefully interpreted as a sage mother will befall and her premium will be prosperous forever. So many people believe that she had that stone and carved herself and had it discovered. What? That doesn't sound <laughs> I right. Know. I'm not supposed to carve this stone, throw it into the river close enough where someone can find it, and then be like, oh my god, it's about me! The only Chinese oh, fortune no, cookie. you shouldn't have. In all of the history You probably think this rock is about you. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> right, Carly Simon. Oh, that's the best kept secret. Who is that song about? So she is now, effectively, the Emperor of China. 
and she has a stone that says some prophecy from heaven that this is right. And also, to ensure that the security of her new reign is not uh, tampered with, I guess, um, she has all the members of the Tang Dynasty royal family imprisoned, including the future emperor who will come after her, and she proclaims herself to be an incarnation of the Maitreya Buddha, which um, is very important. Unfortunately, I can't remember what uh, sect of Buddhism Maitreya is from, but they are very important. I think it might be a bodhisattva. So she basically tells everybody that she is reincarnation of this Buddha, and that is why she is the best person to be on the throne. And she has a statue of Maitreya commissioned, but instead of the face you would normally see, it is her face, and it's meant to resemble her. And this is all meant to persuade people that she should be on the throne. <sighs> Any questions? I'm still singing I'm, You're So Vain in my head because it's getting more and more true. I just yeah, like the uh, implication that she, the, the Chinese people also used religious works as propaganda for their own reign. I'm glad it's not just the Western cultures. Universal. Oh, yeah. It's good. Good to know. So, for the most part, her rule was fairly, um, not a whole lot happened. There were still many people who didn't like her. And if you were within the inner circle of the palace, you had a really crappy life. Because if she didn't trust you, if she thought that you didn't agree with her, you were banned, killed, etc. Uh, she had a secret police and spies in the court and throughout the country that reported back to her. Yeah! Wonder what that's like. No way we can relate to that. Hi, FBI man listening to Hi. us. Good sneak preview. So the this yeah, really. <laughs> so this hopefully not the Chinese government. <laughs> no, if anything, it's Putin. Das Vidanya! My grace farewell. I love dark of all night. <laughs> I'm glad you knew where I pulled that from, the little Russian I know. <laughs> From a really historically inaccurate... What? 20th Century Fox isn't a reputable s historical source? What are you talking about? There wasn't a talking bat named Bartok? Clearly the best character he in that movie. And a kicker, sir. Anyways, so the, the spy system served her well in alert alerting her to any plots that might have been uh, created to try and overthrow her. What? Plots for an emperor? Empress? Never. She was not very well liked by the inner circle, but actually she was pretty well liked by the people. Fake news. Because she... So we have a Caesar situation here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And yeah, so if you were on her bad side, sucks to suck. You were gone. <laughs> I love this because I know you don't I know. swear. So I don't. So it's making it even better. I was like, for people who don't know Rachel, that was basically an F-bomb from her. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of bologna sandwiching going on. <laughs> she also decided, you know what, I'm going to create my own Chinese characters. So she did that, which was meant to further implement herself as a ruler of China and throughout history. They were meant to replace 10 and 30 of the older characters. And I said it was meant to attempt, the, attempt to change the way that people thought and wrote. So... One of the most famous things that she had was this petition box where people could... Now, it wasn't a box because they didn't really have boxes then. It was like a giant brass cauldron, basically. And people could come and put their little thoughts in the cauldron about policies, about how things were going, about officials, and if they thought the officials were not doing very well. So this was a big, a big step for... The people of China because now Wu Zetian wanted to know what their thoughts were in order to help the country better. So, you know, if you go to the community and you drop in it, and it was all as anonymous as it could be, I guess. So, some of her goals were to get rid of corrupt officials, and she also wanted to change the way that education worked. So, she improved the public education system by hiring dedicated teachers and reorganizing the bureaucracy and teaching methods. 
She also reformed the Department of Agriculture and the system of taxation by rewarding officials who produced the greatest amount of crops and taxed their people the least. So this actually was a pretty prosperous time for the people of China. Agriculture increased, taxes were low, uh, there wasn't starvation, people were fairly happy with how things were going. It was just the officials and inner circle who were not happy because A, there was a woman controlling things, which was a big no-no, and she didn't really care what they thought, and yeah. So wait, um, I, I'm sorry, I just normally whenever the officials have to have like crop um, quotas or whatever, it tends to lead to people starving just because over, like they will over give crops or over quote crops, and that didn't happen? I didn't read anything where that happened. Um, they also had a lot more land that they were able to create for agriculture, so that might have offset some of the, uh, I guess, falsifying of numbers. Because there was a so it's better than communism, is what you're saying. Because the examples I'm using are communist. I feel like most things are better than communism in practice. So, as I would say, there is a. I didn't read anything about. Uh, lower or higher quotas being reported. So if you see something or hear something, go ahead and correct me. Um, I didn't find anything in my resources. So they had the military exams instead of promotions by who you knew. So it was based on merit, as you said. She had her spy network and her secret police. She was all set. She had everything. And she... Oh, so... She had a group of women go up to this holy mountain and perform ritual ceremonies, which normally were only performed by men. So that was a big deal um, because she was taught that she was equal to men growing up. So she thought that, you know, I can do whatever I want. So if the men can do it, I can do it. It's kind of the anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> do anything better than you. Look at us all on the same page. I think that's what she was thinking. Um, she also had it made where normally if a parent died, you would only really honor the father through ancestral rights, but she added that you would honor both your parents. So in a way, she was kind of, uh, kind of, I guess, campaigning for women's rights, but she's not quite labeled a feminist, but she definitely wanted to... Uh, allow women to have some of the same rights that she had growing up. I would say she definitely seems like a feminist in a sense because, I mean, if you're going to campaign for women's rights in some way, you can still be a feminist. Mm -hmm. Doesn't a lot of that yeah. come from the intent? The intent for her actions doesn't so much seem to be I'm doing this for the furtherance of my gender. It's more, I want the power. It's yeah, it was more like her personal game, but also as an after effect, I guess she did help women around her because she kind of said, screw it to the, <laughs> the patriarchy and probably gave them an inappropriate finger. <laughs> and as she probably right, did, she tell, did that, she tell Rachel? them that they're number one? I'm not gonna do it. I'm not <laughs> stupid. Courtney knows Courtney's well versed in it. Courtney already did it to me once today. So. Did she tell them that they're number one? She did. She did. And then she cut their head off. <laughs> That's even better. That's even better. You don't even just give them the finger. You're just like, finger, oh, cut. Finger guillotine. Boom. Bye, bitch. Bye-bye. Thanks for disagreeing. Yeah, no one liked to disagree in front of her because they knew what would happen. So in 697 CE, her hold on the empire and her power began to slip because she became more paranoid. And she began spending time with these two brothers called the Jong brothers. And they were her young lovers. So she was about in her 70s. Get what? it, girl! Get it! Get it! Get it, girl! Get it, girl! Get it, girl! Get it, girl! She was. I'm not she was. I'm sure she was. I'm sure she was. I'm sure she was. And I'm willing to bet she wasn't either, but okay. She got two young dudes, man. So she spent a lot more time with them than she did in stately affairs and, you know, ruling the kingdom of China. So the people around her got very upset and they got so upset and were so bothered by the fact that 
these Zhang brothers were around and they kind of had a bit of a some persuasion over her. You Dick know, persuasion. Yeah, persuasion. And she, because of them, got really into aphrodisiac. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> this is a completely different turn than what I was expecting. This feels like a gender reverse Louis the Fourteenth right now. I was thinking Versailles. Oh where yeah. Where they had the whole thing. Oh, but you haven't seen that part. Yet. Never mind. Ignore me. So these John brothers are causing a muck in the royal kingdom. <laughs> And so the officials decide the best way to deal with this is to banish them. I really thought you were going to say emasculate both brothers. Actually, there was a belief that they were eunuchs, but I don't know. So they might have already. If they're eunuchs. Okay, Ashley, let's get into castration. We already talked about this. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows? Courtney knows, apparently. I I do actually know. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll. I'll, what's the word? Anyways, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think I read somewhere where, you know, the only way that men could usually get into the palace was if they were born there, if they were the emperor, or if they were eunuchs. Because they didn't want them sleeping around with the concubines. So they might have been eunuchs. I don't know for sure. Now, Courtney, go. Okay, so cast. it depends on the type of castration they had. Because sometimes it's everything. Sometimes it's just the balls, but it depends on the version of it. And also the version of it, if you, if it's all of it and how they do like how they, if they just like tie it off or whatnot, depends whether or not you die or not. Because uh, if you, if they just a clean cut and then just kind of put bandages. Um, I actually believe the Chinese or the Ottoman Empire's way of creating eunuchs was the most deadly. So why do you know so much about this? Off the top of your head, I think is the real question now. Forget my question about how they were servicing the seventy-year-old woman. I, I ha, what? I mean, like if if it's just the if it's just the balls, they can still function. Um, but every time I had to teach Abelard and Eloise, oh, I always like to make my students feel really that. uncomfortable. But I was curious on the level of it, and so I kept going back to the same thing to refresh in my memory on it. And let me tell you. Female students had more problems with male castration than men. They didn't want to say castration. Uh, they more just said his accident. <sighs> was not an accident, which but okay. It was not an accident in his case, but uh, yeah, so that's why I know this much. Fair enough, all right. The guys just more looked in pain the whole time we talked about it. <laughs> which, I mean, it's fair. I'm not going to lie, it's fair. that I'm sure they're very attached. Literally. <laughs> Rachel's sitting there like, are you done yet? <laughs> I take it back. They were not exiled. They were killed. Oh. And uh, Wu Zetian is like, well, crap. This sucks. But, you know, she's she can't show that she was saddened by it, I guess. So that son that she had sent away earlier comes back and demands that she abdicates the throne. And she says, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> and so she abdicates the f- throne to her son who and his wife, who she banished many, many years ago. And then within about a year, she actually passes away, and she dies from natural causes. So despite everything that she did to everyone, nobody does try to poison her. <laughs> um, Maybe they were just scared that if they tried, her spirit would be a, one of those vengeful ghosts. And just go around and be like, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. Push out! Ah, ah. I can see that. So her tomb, she was buried next to her husband, the Emperor Gaozhong. But her tomb isn't labeled, which kind of goes back to this idea that she was a woman. Mm. And they didn't want to, I guess, glorify in Chinese history what she had done. But in recent years, people have started to have a slightly better uh, viewpoint of her because although she was a very ruthless leader and she was I guess somewhat power hungry um, she actually did a fairly decent job um, and the Tang Dynasty was pretty prosperous under her and there weren't any major coups or rebellions against her she had her secret police to tell her what was going on so she had a pretty good idea so basically to sum her up 
she started and ended any problems she caused. <laughs> well, that's good. I know. So any problems that were started, she started them and she ended them. So, so that is the story of Wu Zetian, who hopefully has a slightly better viewpoint that she has had in previous years over Chinese history. Any questions? Q&A time? So did they try to do, like, the Nefertiti thing where they didn't like her and so they just took any image of her, broke it up, that kind of thing? Um, not quite. It was more they just, uh, kind of painted her in a very poor light as a power-hungry killer of her family, uh, someone who just disregarded Confucian philosophy. And that's, like, I mean, most people in the West don't realize how huge of a thing that is for that period in China. It was their religion in a sense because it was very much everything about their way of life and how yeah. you behaved and yeah, probably more so than catholicism because catholicism didn't always moderate your behavior you know mm -hmm. it was supposed to but yeah so i mean confucianism is is important um and even today it's very important and it dictates mostly the relationship that you have between different people in your life so I, I should know this, but um, some of the different relationships that they talk about is the relationship between man and wife, emperor and his country, teacher and student, brother, younger brother. And it's kind of this how you need to honor your family, honor your ancestors. And, you know, the emperor, his job is to watch over the people and be a benevolent ruler. And so it was a pretty big deal when a woman in a very man promoting uh time period i guess uh became the emperor and actually it wasn't because um you know someone had died off or her son it was because she had basically went and said i'm gonna be the emperor and there's nothing you can do about it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah well thank you rachel yeah okay so we're going to be a part of the End the Backlog Fundraiser and True po Crime Podcast prize draw wow. um, with ho that's hosted by Nothing Rhymes with Murder. So make sure you go and uh, get involved with that. We'll be sharing that through until basically until it ends. So check out all our social medias for that. Okay, so we have, again, two podcasts in this week's podcast corner. Um, the first one we're going to have is Wives Tales, which if you love, well, Wives Tales and learning about fun urban legends, some, a little bit of true crime. I mean, it's hard to describe them, but they're amazing and it's a great time. It's two cousins, uh, Shelby and Jenny. And I mean, they're hilarious and their, their picks of topics are so funny. Um, they did... The melon heads as well and i was like they took a different take on it and i was just sitting there like oh my gosh this is so different than what i grew up with so definitely check them out and then ashley what's our other one our other one is cowtown crime blog which you can find at cowtowncrime.com it's an examination of murders and murderers in the north texas area uh, after a quarter of a century as a prosecutor marguerite shares the cases the victims, and the families that have left marks on her heart. Her experience and first-hand knowledge of the Texas legal system brings a unique perspective to the stories. Every Monday, she covers a murder you probably don't know but should, and every Wednesday, she reviews a podcast or a book of interest to true crime enthusiasts. And she actually reviewed our podcast, and it was super fun. Hey guys. Hey y'all. I'm Shelby. I'm Jenny. And we are Wives Tales. Yeah, we're a weekly podcast all about dark mysteries, twisted legends, spooky folklore, and creepy creatures. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can find us anywhere podcasts are played pretty much. Yeah. Um, y'all keep it twisty. That's right. Bye. Thank you, Rachel, for coming on to the podcast again. I hope I did okay. You did great. You did very well. <laughs> you did better than we did, arguably. I feel very <laughs> disorganized at times. I was like, oh, no, it's everywhere. Oh, you're fine. Thank you for listening to The Cult of Domesticity. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Chorus, Spotify, YouTube, and Podbean. If we're not on your preferred app, 
first of all. Again, how? How? Or is, is someone forcing you? In that case, give them a hug. Um, but let us know what your preferred app is so we can get on that. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to help spread the word. Or be that person who, in a car road trip this summer, just plays us the whole time. We'll appreciate you. I did that the other your day. Your friends and car mates may not, but I we will. I did that the other day. Yes! See, we appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Um, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Domestic Podcasts and at The Cult of Domesticity on Instagram to get the episode tip off, recipe of the week, and additional information about the week's topics. You can also find our podcast merch on Threadless by searching for The Cult of Domesticity. And if you're feeling particularly generous, we have set up a tip jar on PayPal. Finally, to suggest a recipe or topic, you can email us at domesticpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, high five. High five. <laughs>